So, it is time again. Another year wasted. Wasted on amazing games. But you know what's curious? Looking over my list of games released this year that I had an interest in and that were actually worth a damn, well, it wasn't quite as long as the last few years. And I don't think the reason for that is that there just weren't as many good games released this year. It's more like this year in particular I had way less time to play all those awesome games. It was a really stressful year. But that doesn't mean I haven't played way more great games than I could fit on a top 10 list. But I won't let that discourage me. And as always, this isn't really a top 10. There are no hard rankings. I'm gonna save my absolute favorites for the end of the video, but every game that made it on this list was already pretty darn great, at least to me. But yeah, there will be some obvious choices missing from this list because I didn't get around playing those games. To get it out of the way, I haven't yet found the time to dive into Baldur's Gate 3 and I won't play Alan Wake 2 as long as it's digital only. But you know what I did play? Process of elimination. Yeah, here's a new year's resolution. Try to be more careful when choosing games to play. And with that, we start off this list of amazing games from 2023. And we hit it off with a quickfire round for games I couldn't fit in any other spot, because I obsessively try to arrange games together according to rules that might come across as arbitrary, but make total sense in my convoluted mind. Moving on. The amazing current Hitman trilogy, recently rebranded to World of Assassination, as if it was about a cabal of highly trained professional killers fighting against a shadow organization that aims to control all of society, and they all operate under some kind of creed. Uh, but anyways, the World of Assassination got a very fitting free add-on with the Freelancer DLC. In this you take 47 all over the world to act out assassination plans. So more of the same, right? Not quite. The DLC reuses all locations from all three games and has you assassinate random NPCs selected from those already having inhabited the map. So rather lazy and cheap, right? Not quite. The freelancer mode seems to take place after the conclusion of the World of Assassination trilogy, where the agency is no more and 47 has gone, well, freelance. His new goal is to bring down the aforementioned shadowy crime organizations. Their leaders are unknown, so he has to work his way up from the lowliest hired goons to the high-ranking syndicate members. From his safe house he plans his missions and chooses his equipment. There are, aside from direct hits against a syndicate, always multiple missions to choose from, with their own quirks and challenges, which 47 has to overcome with cunning and creative thinking. While those missions are never as complex as the campaign missions, they let you experience the familiar locations in different ways, have you experiment once more. In that regard, the missions are similar to the user-generated contracts introduced back in Hitman <coughs> absolution, but having them tied together in this procedurally generated campaign, working towards a goal, having ever-changing conditions and restrictions, and an increasing challenge level with each mission you successfully complete, and having the fear of losing everything always looming over you, and an emphasis on efficiency rather than perfection, makes this so much more engaging. Next up is Bramble. I discovered this randomly. I didn't see any advertisement for it or anything. It at one point just popped up in my recommendations or maybe in the similar games section of another game. I'm not sure. But I really liked what I saw. The screenshots looked amazing, both in terms of graphics and art design. The game itself is an extremely violent trial and error action puzzler in the vein of Little Nightmares. But where Little Nightmares just implied most of the violence and disturbed you with the things it didn't overtly show, Bramble goes all out with the blood and gore. And it also shows some real glee in its sadism, so be aware of that. A game I was really looking forward to was the new Theat Rhythm. I really enjoyed the previous two games for the 3DS, 
as well as the Kingdom Hearts spin-off, I guess? Despite some issues I had with it, stemming mostly from dropping the vastly superior touch controls. And the new game doubles down on these issues. It certainly improved on some of its predecessor's elements, but also made a few steps back or dropped some features completely. Not the definitive edition, as I would have hoped. I feel like I still like the second game the most, but there are some reasons to choose this version over the others. In the end, it comes down to preference, and no matter which version you choose, you get a ton of great songs from the whole Final Fantasy catalogue and even some others to listen to and play. With the exception of Final Fantasy XIII, of course. Oh, I'm gonna suffer for this. And we're gonna continue with some awesome music in Hi-Fi Rush. Last year I put Metal Hellsinger on my favorites list for its so well done genre mix of rhythm game and action. And this game achieved something similar. Instead of a first person shooter with doom like aesthetic, this game is a colorful comic style beat em up where you punch baddies to the rhythm of the music. Even your footsteps are synced to the rhythm. Certainly a must for fans of rhythm games. A highlight for many people this year was the release of finally a Harry Potter RPG. Fans have been waiting for this for years, but had to be content with the mediocre or subpar movie adaptations or LEGO games that, fun as they are, just don't satisfy this wizard and witch fantasy itch. The closest we came to a Hogwarts game for the longest time was Fire Emblem Three Houses, in where we ourselves took on the mantle of house teacher. But it still wasn't a real deal. But with Hogwarts Legacy, we finally were able to indulge in that magical boarding school fantasy. The game takes place quite a while before the events of the books, so aside from some important lore shenanigans, the developers, and by extension we as players, are free to do in this game whatever we want. We get to attend magic class and learn new spells, we get to learn how to ride a broomstick and fly around the castle grounds, and we get to follow a rather weak story and take on bland and tedious side quests. The game isn't the greatest RPG out there. It's passable at best and the spell and combat system, while certainly complex and rich with customization, doesn't hold up to scrutiny as well. The whole leveling system feels tacked on and it seems to only serve to gate off progress letting you only attempt certain things and equip certain items after you reached this or that level. The developers had a lot of ideas they wanted to include in that game. They were certainly ambitious, but either not talented enough to integrate all those ideas serviceable or just lack the time to get it done. Or maybe they just put all their resources in the castle itself, because that one is just incredible. You can wander the long halls and corridors of Hogwarts find secret paths and hidden rooms, visit all the iconic locations and discover new ones. So much attention to detail went into this game world, you can and will spend hours just exploring every inch of this castle. But the deaths didn't stop there. You can venture into the forbidden forest and the surrounding hamlets and of course Hogsmeade, which is such a joy to behold with all its silly little nudges towards the setting I guess. So yeah, with all its flaws, and there are many, this game is worth it alone for letting me explore the most magical of castles. Step aside Disney, I finally arrived in Hogwarts. Okay, bear with me for a moment. I'm a huge fan of everything VR. I want to see more of it. I want the concept to be explored even further. My PC isn't powerful enough to offer me a great VR experience and VR headsets for PC are still pretty expensive. So I was really happy with my PSVR. It was a lot cheaper but still offered quite a good experience for what it was. But when they announced the PSVR 2 for the PS5, I knew I had to have it. It cost a bit more but it's still a cheaper alternative to VR on PC. But the hardware is very much on par this time around. Better controls, better resolution, not a million cables sticking out of your head. So yeah, I'd like to put all the PSVR 2 games I played this year on this list. 
Not gonna name all of them here, that's what the montage in the background is for. But just for some highlights, Star Tenders, because I love those food serving games and this one perfectly brings this gameplay loop to VR. Horizon Call of the Mountain, because it's just so amazing to climb these cliffs and behold the beautiful world of Horizon. This here is the game that amazed me the most out of the whole franchise. And of course the VR mode for Resident Evil 8 and the remake of 4. Not perfect conversions to VR, the latter more than the former, but still amazing experiences and totally worth for any RE fan. VR is the future and I'm ready for it. Another much anticipated fantasy game this year would maybe even be the final fantasy game for me this year. 16. It's Final Fantasy 16. And boy does Square go all out with their Final Fantasy releases nowadays. During the good old days those games released every couple of years. Then for a while the gap between new releases widened and at one point it seemed the series mostly survived on FF14 alone. But since the game called Final Fantasy 7 Remake there seems to be a new release every year. For this year two major releases had been planned. But I guess no one would have cared about FF16 if FF7 Rebirth really did come out the same year. In the weeks up to its release there was a bit of controversy. When FF16's producer Naoki Yoshida voiced his displeasure with the term JRPG. He doesn't think he produces JRPGs since to him Japanese RPGs were only just RPGs, which is fair. And the term supposedly having been used to unfairly fans of Japanese RPGs from the rest of the genre, which is not fair. Ask anyone and they will tell you that Japanese media has a certain unique flavor to it. Be it movies, music, comics or games. Calling something a Japanese RPG just refers to certain elements prevalent in Japanese storytelling or gaming customs. While it is true that people rarely use the term Western RPG, CRPG meaning computer role playing game being the agreed on term, the usage of the term JRPG is generally only descriptive and more often than not used endearingly. Because people who think Japanese games are beneath them don't even bother to learn the correct terminology. And especially in recent years it has been accepted as a kind of style, especially with many western made indie games being considered JRPGs, as well as exploration and mechanics focused Japanese games not being counted towards the genre of JRPGs. Just take the Soul series for example. No one would call those JRPGs. That being said and to bring this long preamble to an end, after having played Final Fantasy 16. I have to agree with Yoshida. The game certainly is not a JRPG. I wouldn't even call it an RPG at all. It's more like a spectacle fighter or hack and slash with RPG elements. Oh it certainly is fun and looks amazing, both in its environments as well as in its high octane action pieces. The story tries to be more mature and gritty and seems to have taken a lot of influences from Game of Thrones and the like but comes off as less mature than Final Fantasy VI from nearly 30 years ago, when video games were considered children's toys. Still, a blast to play and a refinement on other attempts to bring this franchise more into the action genre. I at least enjoyed the fights in this game more than in the game called Final Fantasy VII Remake. Next up is a game about hordes of zombies in LA. Wait that sounds boring? Why? Oh no! I don't mean a realistic depiction of LA. I mean a apocalypse of the undead, not teens and hipsters. Those are sadly still alive in the game and bolster the ranks of your playable characters and the friendly NPCs. But cringe worthy writing and voice acting aside, the game is just so much fun. It's less open world than its predecessors, both direct and spiritual, if you could call the Dying Light games that, but there's still a lot of room and opportunity for exploration, different approaches to tackle combat encounters, a sensible amount of side quests, hidden loot stashes, even a few metroidvania like moments where you need the right tools to get access to a room or goodie. 
you unlock a ton of combat abilities to customize your fighting style and really shake up the zombie fighting. And there's a good variety of really fun and creative zombie types. There exist still some of the trappings I had an issue with in the games that came before, like the superfluous leveling system, but most of it isn't that bad. This is just a very fun game you should play if you're not too squeamish when it comes to blood and gore and violence. The Souls-like train chucks along at full steam and there's no stopping it anytime soon. Dark Souls might be over, but this didn't even stop from software from creating more Souls-likes. And they still are the kings when it comes to the genre they created. Every other Souls clone has some weird quirks, is kinda off. It's like the devs didn't fully understand what makes a Souls-like work. Or they try so hard to distinguish their games from the extended Souls family, that they include features that might even be harmful to the formula. Team Ninja showed a lot of competence with Souls likes, they even seem to have fully committed to only produce games of that genre, though they have heavily fallen victim to the principle of including weird mechanics that run counter to Souls design. And Wo Long was no different. Deck 13 also pretty early jumped on the Souls-like bandwagon and created the most blatant copycat with Lords of the Fallen that got a sequel or soft reboot this year. That's a bit less janky, but only a bit. But included a unique feature with its twin dimensions you can swap between the living world and the world of the dead. That is not only visually striking, but also hides a lot and I mean a lot of dangerous trappings and foes. The Souls-like that really captivated me though, and that I was really looking forward to, was Lies of P. I mean, come on. Clockwork automatons patrolling a steampunk city in a dark reinterpretation of Carlo Collodi's masterpiece, where you play as the most handsome version of Pinocchio? The game has its own weird quirks, with a really restrictive combat system that all but demands of you perfection in parrying the ultra fast and sudden enemy attacks, but after you get acclimated to the system, it works rather well. While progression through the game is quite linear and even the levels themselves don't sprawl out too much, there is a lot to discover and side paths to explore, shortcuts to unlock and of course, weapons and trinkets to find. You have a small selection of different sidearms in the form of your puppet arm, a flamethrower, a mine thrower, an auto parry, a shockwave, a grappling hook. There are certainly some creative mechanics in this system. But the star is the weapon rearranging system. Every weapon comes with a body and a handle and you can combine these however you want. Generally, the handle determines the weapon's animation while the body determines its reach and stats. It's a tiny bit more intricate, but this is best experienced by trying out different combinations. And you never know, you might even discover the perfect weapon combination. The setting is both haunting and stunning and you can really lose yourself in this meticulously crafted world. And you'll get frustrated. A lot. But I guess that comes with the territory. Now let's be serious for a moment. A grand adventure released this year, one I was looking forward to ever since they announced it. You know what I mean. The game with star in the title. Oh yeah. Sea of Stars was even more amazing in its full release than in the little demo they published earlier this year. The game combines everything great from the 16-bit era of gaming. Amazing sprite work, beautiful environments, exhilarating music and a story that, despite its, at times, heavy themes, is told in a light-hearted way. The sprite work reminded me a lot of Chrono Trigger or later Quintet games. And level design incorporated a lot of Secret of Mana too, just seamlessly instead of fractured into little rooms, thanks to better technology. And these levels give you tons to explore in really intuitive ways. They made these pixelated labyrinths feel natural, and that's no small feat. And the game offers a fresh take on turn-based battles with really unique ideas, competently executed, and it proves 
that this style of game is far from dead. Now let's take a look at what Nintendo did this year. More of the same it seems. They released Fire Emblem Engage. Well, this franchise is getting milked these days. The recent entry is more of the cheap anime writing that started with Awakening and got worse since then, but still offers the highly engaging, pardon the pun, strategy RPG gameplay and doubles down on some very welcome quality of life features. Detective Pikachu got a sequel for the Nintendo Switch and is once again a rather shallow crime solving game with the most adorable little detective and his kinda boring human partner. The gameplay, while diversified, also got more simplified. A fine little game if you just want to watch the cute little Pikachu detective, but as an adventure game far too shallow. Mario Kart 8's booster pass that was introduced last year finally concluded, so now we have double the racing tracks in Mario Kart's best iteration. It kinda saddens me to know that there will be a Mario Kart 9 at some point in the future that will offer a lot less variety just because of the sheer amount of content in this game. My hope is that Mario Kart 8 will become a platform with more and more content added onto it. Maybe so that someday all tracks from all Mario Kart games will find a place in this neat little bundle. For now we have the biggest track list ever to enjoy with a huge selection of different racers, so yeah, truly the definitive Mario Kart experience. The cute little flower spirits also returned this year's with Pikmin 4, a cute as hell small scale tactics game both in the scope of the battles as well as in the height of the characters. You once again play a tiny astronaut stranding on an Earth-like planet that might just be Earth, who am I to say? Our job is to find Captain Olimar, but on the way we rescue a whole bunch of other travelers. We also have to repair and upgrade our ship, research all kinds of phenomena and explore a huge game world localized entirely within one house and its backyard. And of course you get to lead the adorable little Pikmin into battle and have them solve puzzles for you and carry your stuff. I kinda feel bad for putting them to work so much. The game is more Pikmin, as you'd expect it, just more refined, with helpful abilities to make the tried and proven exploration more convenient, with highly detailed environments and goodies to find to make this game a visual treat and an amazing one-on-one -on -one battle mode that could be its own game that Nintendo will never release just because I want it so much. But the most the same this year was The Legend of Zelda Tears of the Kingdom. It pretty much copied the whole map of its predecessor in tow with most of the mechanics, enemies, graphics and it refined and improved on all of them. They rectified most of the problems of the original game without throwing out the old systems. They actually worked to improve the mechanics and stayed true to their original vision. Enemy level scaling got toned down, weapon damage doesn't fluctuate as much, so your equipment still breaks all the time, but a good weapon breaking doesn't feel like such a waste anymore. There are more permanent upgrades this time around and the new abilities fully emphasize the free form and experimental approach to any challenge in your way. Why should you walk 4 minutes to a place if you could build a vehicle and drive and fly there in just 40 minutes. Because it's fucking fun. Building tools to help with a challenge, fusing weapons with all kinds of attachments or just other weapons. This kind of is the game Breath of the Wild should have been. Maybe it's not the perfect sequel, more of an update, a definitive edition that comes with a different story. A brand new adventure in a familiar world that's absolutely worth playing. There were also some remakes and remasters, for example Barton Kaitos that sadly got a really badly made remaster that can't hold a stable frame rate if its life depended on it. Normally I'd be happy to see this awesome game getting another chance to gather an audience, but this worse version only leaves them with a bad impression. So maybe it should have stayed dead. The game is so amazing, but the remaster is so bad 
even with the added modern quality of life features. And they also used the original Japanese intro movie with all its badly acted English prose and not the superior English read-up. The one time the localization is better. But we also got a pretty great remake of Metroid Prime. They added so many quality of life features, made pretty much every previous control scheme available and touched up the graphics to make it look really nice even by modern standards. Not that it ever looked bad. That's how you do it. More of that Nintendo. Oh, already? <laughs> yeah, let's keep them coming. No one would have suspected a remake of the first Mario RPG. Its re-release on the SNES Mini seemed to be the most we could have ever expected, but then they gave us this gem. All the graphics have been reimagined with fully 3D models, but they kept the style intact, along with everything else. They added a few features, but the experience is mostly the same. You can experience Mario's first RPG outing with a fresh new coat of paint and it is a must play for fans of either the Mario and Luigi or the Paper Mario series. And speaking of Paper Mario, Nintendo even announced a remake of the Thousand Year Door for the coming year. Truly a time to be alive for Paper Mario fans. It's like Nintendo just came out saying, so you like the old games so much, here you can have them again. Now pay us. And I gladly take it. And while I'm talking about remakes, the Evercade is still going strong in bringing back games from the good old days. Just recently they released the Duke Nukem collection. And there were a few others, but two of them were highly anticipated. Holy shit, here it is. RE4 was such an amazing and influential game, so could a second stab at it even live up to its legacy? Well, they sure gave it their all. The Resident Evil 4 remake is incredible. They stayed true to so many moments of the original, but mixed it up in a lot of places, so that this remake becomes its own thing. Yeah, you fight in the village square against the horde and the chainsaw dude, you battle El Gigantes and lake monsters, you explore the castle, the mines and the military base. Leon is still a cocky action hero, but not as cartoonish as in the original. Some of the original's charm might have been lost in the process, but the game gained so much in other regards, in how you now explore the different locations, in the scale of it all. This game won't replace the original for me, but it is a welcome addition to the Resident Evil franchise. But if you wanted some actual horror, you had to look towards Amnesia the Bunker. Now that game is terrifying. It very much follows Frictional's usual approach to interactivity. You have to open and close doors and drawers manually, utilize seemingly useless stuff in the environment to solve puzzles and open up new ways and try to avoid horrible monsters while on the lookout for resources, pieces of lore and helpful clues. What's new for an amnesia game is that you can actually defend yourself this time. Near the start of the game you get a revolver and can even find a shotgun later. Now, ammo isn't something you have in abundance, so you have to make every shot count and try to not overly rely on your gun. Because throughout the whole game you're being hunted by the stalker who can instantly kill you when he gets his claws on you. And you have to travel across the whole bunker and back, a lot, to find certain items you need to escape. And of course there are a lot of roadblocks in your way that force you to adapt, find different solutions. You not only have to manage your limited inventory, make smart decisions about what and what not to take with you on each trip into the bowels of the bunker, you also have to manage your gasoline consume. Because if you don't want to play the whole game in total darkness, you have to constantly feed a generator. And this thing is your lifeline. Keeping the lights on has the stalker a bit more hesitant in pursuing you and you have an easier time finding the items you need. An amazing horror playground that doesn't eat up too much of your time, but it stays with you long after shutting the game off. The other massive remake this year that was also a horror game was Dead Space. And holy shit did it blow me away. Other than the Resident Evil 4 remake, 
they stuck very close to the original game but improved on so many things. The environments now have so much more detail, the shadows are darker, light utilized to even greater effects. Necromorphs never looked so disgusting with this game's damage layer system. And now the Ishimura is one giant interconnected ship, not just a sequence of isolated levels. You can still take the tram to travel to different stations, but now you can also just walk on foot and fight even more horrible creatures on the way. And while the game uses broadly the same structure, floor plans and set pieces of the original, it added onto it and changed up a few things here and there. Well, it changed up a lot, but it did so in such a subtle and faithful and respectful manner that you only really notice it by comparing it side by side with the original. Zero Graph plays now more like in Dead Space 2 and 3. The asteroid trench and the accompanying shooting section got combined and completely overhauled. Weapon upgrading got tweaked, there's now a series of side quests in the game to unlock certain doors that could be overwritten with power nodes in the original, another one to follow a minor character from the original game and yet another one to learn more about what Isaac's girlfriend Nicole was up to while everything went to shit on the Ishimura. And especially this piece of extra content is just incredible and enriches the lore so much. Nicole has now a story in the game. Not everything got straight up better. There are a few points of contention for many people, but nevertheless, this is a phenomenal remake. And while I wouldn't say it 100% replaces the original, because I don't think any remake really would, given that the original wasn't completely broken or something like that. Not even the masterpiece that is the Resident Evil 1 remake. What I can say is that I overall prefer the remake over the original. And having mentioned the Resident Evil 1 remake, well, I still think it is the greatest video game remake of all times. But I guess Dead Space now is a close second. And last but not least, Super Mario Bros. Wonder. Oh man, this game. I talked earlier about Nintendo games that are more of the same. Well, this game was absolutely not the same in any way. At first, I was highly skeptical seeing how Nintendo handled the past bunch of 2D Mario games. But the reveal also intrigued me with its somewhat strange look and its insanity. And oh man, Nintendo fully delivered. All the levels are weird and wacky and offer at least one exhilarating level gimmick. Aside from the bonus stages, no two levels are the same, there's always a twist. And everything just looks and sounds so jovial and upbeat. It's just a pleasure to play. And you now can, for the first time ever, play as Princess Daisy in a mainline Mario game. The first time since her debut in 1989. That was my personal highlight, in a game full of highlights. Enemy variety is huge, the new power-ups encourage experimentation a lot and are surely a dream for speedrunners. And the secondary power-ups in the form of badges are an amazing new inclusion that provide even more customization when it comes to your playstyle. You can either run faster or jump higher, but also more floaty. You can have a spin jump, a vertical wall dash, a glider. There are so many options to play the game how you want. And then there's the wonder seeds. Every major level has a hidden wonder seed that you need to find to start a bonus challenge. And with these, anything can happen. A stage hazard draws closer and closer, alternate paths open up, the game changes perspective, you become slender guy or the level gets just completely insane. The game is just pure joy, not the grandest game this year, not the one with the highest budget, not the longest, but the one I simply had the most fun with. And sometimes you don't need anything else. I hope this year also had a lot in stock for you. Moments of joy, accomplishments, awesome games of course. And if it had, hey, let's share your good fortune with friends and family. And maybe even strangers who've got it rough. 
Sometimes it's just a few nice words and a smile that helps someone down on their luck through the day. And let's all make the next year better than the last. And well, when it comes to games, there are already a few I'm looking forward to. So yeah, with that I'm heading off. This has been Rady and I wish you the greatest of days and an incredible year 2024.